My name is Emily Ward, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today, I'm going to tell you about some new work from my lab, specifically exploring failures of perception in humans and machines. My lab at the University of Wisconsin is called the Visual Cognition Lab. We work on a number of different things, but a primary research focus is visual awareness. We get a sense of how rich our visual experience is just by taking a quick tour around Madison. Here's a shot from our local farmer's market. You can see a lot of different shapes of vegetables, a lot of different colors, a lot of different textures. Heading next to the university, there is a big social gathering spot, the terrace, which features these iconic chairs, all different colors, all different orientations, but we can still appreciate that they're all chairs despite all these differences among them. Finally, catching a sunset at the terrace is a great way to really appreciate how rich and detailed our visual experience seems to be. Yet, we know of a lot of cases where what we see is very different from what exists out there in the world. We are apt to fail to notice salient changes in the environment. These two pictures come from a video demonstrating change blindness, and you can see by looking back and forth between them that there's actually quite a bit different between these two images, but probably you didn't notice that right away, even though they are right in front of your eyes. On the other hand, we see things that don't actually exist in the world. So here we see a difference in the length of these lines, even though no difference exists. We can see illusions of size, illusions of depth, and illusions where just the orientation vertical versus horizontal of an item can change what we see. The surface of these two tables, for example, is identical as I can demonstrate here by overlaying them. So it's pretty interesting that on one hand, we have this very rich and vertical perception, while on the other hand, there's plenty of instances where our perception seems to be very sparse and illusory. My lab is really interested in this contradiction. Why do we perceive things that don't exist, while often failing to perceive what is plainly in sight? These examples of change blindness and visual illusion are both cases of failures of perception. My lab has been using a new approach to try and understand the nature of these types of failures. We've been using behavior of humans and behavior of computer vision models to see what both of these can tell us about the nature of failures of perception. In particular, what type of human behavior is and is not displayed by deep learning models, and what about deep learning models can tell us about why humans experience certain types of failures of perception. First, we'll focus on how human behavior compares to neural network behavior. I've been talking about these examples as failures of perception, but for a lot of these, if you talk to any vision scientist, a lot of these are actually examples of features of perception. In particular, a lot of visual illusions tell us something very specific about the architecture of the visual system. I'm not going to focus on that here. Instead, my lab has been interested in the question of why do we see visual illusions in the first place? Is it because the visual system has many perceptual goals? Or is it the case that there's one very important perceptual goal that leads us to develop a lot of the perceptual biases that produce illusions? One such perceptual goal that seems to be really critical to human survival is recognizing objects. It's impossible to answer this question in humans. We can't very well restrict babies to having one particular visual task that they have to solve. Fortunately, we now have many deep neural networks that share the same perceptual goal with people recognizing objects. Here's an example of one such network. Without getting into the details of how exactly these networks accomplish this, the idea is if I show this network a picture of an apple, it will be able to produce a label corresponding to what the picture actually is. So it shares the same perceptual goal with humans. And our question was, does it also share human illusions? I tested several different illusions, including the mueller lyer illusion, the Ebbinghaus illusion, and the Ponzo illusion. I compared performance in people and deep neural networks. Importantly, these deep neural networks are ones that are pre-trained for object recognition, so I didn't do any additional training. I also used people who are pre-trained in all the ways that people tend to be pre-trained in. Assessing illusions in people is relatively easy. If I were testing you, I would present you with the target illusion and these two choices and ask you which item matches the size of the target illusion. Here, maybe you'd think it's a longer line and choose that one. I can then plot it like this. 
On the x-axis is the length of the test item, and on the y-axis is whether or not you chose the longer of the two items. Here, the longer line was chosen, and it's longer than the identical line, so that would yield a point here. When the test item gets too long, you will choose the shorter line, yielding a point here. Alternatively, when the test item is too short, you'll choose a longer line, yielding a point here. In this way, we construct a psychometric curve for the illusion and measure illusion magnitude by finding the 50% mark. Doing this for humans is relatively easy. It's a little more tricky for neural networks, but we can find the same kind of approach. So here, instead of letting the network produce a label, we take the second to last layer, which we treat as a vector of numbers. We get a vector for the test solution. We get a vector for both the identical and for the test item. Then we can use a measure of similarity to judge how similar each of the test items are to the target illusion. The one that is most similar is the network's perception, or at least the network's choice in these cases. So just like with humans, in this case, the network is producing a choice of a longer line that matches best to the target illusion, yielding a point here. And at a certain point, there might be cases where the shorter line is most similar to the target illusion, yielding a point here. Same thing when we have a line that is too short. So for both humans and networks, we can find the magnitude of these illusions. Using this analytic approach, I can now show actual data for humans and deep neural networks. Because Mueller Liar has two versions, there's going to be two curves here initially for just humans. When the line appears longer than it actually is, humans indeed continue to choose longer. When it appears shorter, they choose the shorter ones faster. So there's a differential response between these on either side of that identical line. Neural networks also show this same differential response, where they continue to choose the longer one compared when they are shown the longer illusion compared to when they show the shorter illusion. Thus, neural networks exhibit this shifted but differential response to Mueller liar errors. What about the other illusions? Here, plotting Ebbinghaus. Humans show it, and here there is a little bit of a difference, but it's much less of a fit for this. However, we're still looking for this differential response to the two illusion versions rather than an exact magnitude of illusion. So these neural networks also exhibit small but differential response to Ebbinghaus, but it doesn't seem like it's the same type of illusion compared to humans. For the Ponzo illusion, humans demonstrate it, but networks do not. So, when comparing humans and deep neural networks, they both exhibit mueller liar illusion. There might be some similarity in exhibiting the Ebbinghaus illusion, but there's big differences for other illusions, such as the Ponzo illusion. So to answer the question of why do we see illusions, it seems like some perceptual biases may come for free in a system with similar perceptual goals, but certainly not all biases. This idea of signal that comes for free when you learn one particular type of perceptual goal is an idea that my lab is really interested in at this point, and there's several new topics that we're exploring about these types of hidden signals. Another finding that I didn't have time to talk about here was that deeper networks may better approximate perceptual inferences underlying these illusions. Going forward, my lab is also doing a lot of comparative work between different networks to see what type of architecture better matches human visual experience, in particular, these types of failures of awareness. Comparing humans and deep neural networks obviously will yield a lot of differences between the two systems, but there may be some very interesting avenues where the two systems align. There's also potential for learning about failures of perception by looking at what types of representations these networks have in explaining different types of failures of perception. For that, we're going to go back to the example of change blindness. So I'll show you an example here in a second. This is work with a fellow panelist, Michael Cohen. You'll see this picture flickering between two different versions with one small change happening in one of the versions. I'll show this for about 10 seconds and then point out what the change was.
You might have gotten a hint right there in that sudden shift between the versions, but the thing that changed in this was the position of the nose on this punk boot, where it moved vertically up and down between the two versions. It's a pretty hard change to spot, and there's a lot of difference in how long people take to detect changes like this. So what can we learn from neural networks that might help predict when people suffer from these types of failures awareness and why? The typical explanation for failures awareness usually relies on mechanisms such as attention, representation, even motivation of people. However, in deep neural networks, there's only representation. These networks have no attention, they don't have any differences in motivation. And so it makes it an interesting test bed to compare what, again, you can gain by having only one type of information present. For this, we used different stimulus sets, some classic, some that we made ourselves, and tested whether or not the representation in these networks contributed to change blindness. We took a similar approach here as I did earlier with the visual illusions. Using the same networks, we showed it versions of change blindness images and took the second to last layer. From this layer, we can get a vector of activation values for one version of the image. We can do the same thing for the second version of the image. And again, use a similarity metric here to compare how similar these network representations are. Then we can use this network similarity to predict how long people will take to notice the change from these two images. Here, these two pictures yield really similar representations, and so we predicted that this would yield long change blindness durations, so point up here. Other changes, like changing the pumpkin to purple, are pretty obvious. This would yield a representation value that is less similar in the network and would correspondingly be easier for people to see. So again, we are predicting from network representations the behavior in humans. Combining across the different stimulus set, but still plotting network similarity, predicting change blindness duration, we find a distribution that follows the same as our hypotheses. The idea being that the more similar representations are in the network, the longer people take. There's obviously differences among stimulus sets here, but collapsing across these, there's a very strong positive trend. So what this shows is that overall, network representation similarity predicts change blindness in people. These two studies that I've talked about directly address a question that my lab is most interested in. Why do we perceive things that don't exist while often failing to perceive what is plainly in sight? First of all, I've shown that perceptual biases may come for free in a system with similar perceptual goals. This is regardless of what form the system actually takes, be it a deep neural network or a human. Second, that the representational similarity in these networks can be very useful in predicting when failures of awareness occur. So I hope I've convinced you that comparing in tandem human behavior and neural network performance can be mutually beneficial to understanding both the similarities and differences between these two systems, but also using deep neural networks as a model system that is much more constrained in many ways than people. There's a lot more interesting work that I have going using the same kind of approach I'd be very excited to talk to somebody who also shares these interests. Thank you.